tonight on Nation to Nation. NDP MP Mumilak Karkark says the federal government knows it isn't doing enough for housing in Nunavut. She's about to release a report on a housing tour she did there nearly two years ago. The same tour that caused her to go on stress leave from Parliament. I'm now faced with an institution that says they know this is happening, but I just saw all this really heartbreaking stuff and it took a while for me to really wrap my head around it. But it's not just Nunavut with a housing crisis. It's been happening across the country in First Nations communities for decades. Historical uh, failures by successive governments has resulted in a humanitarian crisis on our First Nations. Hello, I'm Paul Lamarat, and welcome to Nation to Nation. Soon after she was elected in 2019, NDP MP for Nunavut, Mumilak Kakak, toured five communities in the territory to look at housing conditions in her riding. The result was twofold, a report which will be released next week in conjunction with a Nunavut housing forum Ms. Kakak will be participating in. But secondly, the tour contributed to a period of stress and burnout that led Ms. Kakak to take two months off from Parliament last autumn. To talk about all that, I'm now joined by Mumilak Kakak. Welcome to Nation to Nation. Thank you for having me, Todd. I really appreciate it. Now, you knew housing conditions in Nunavut were bad, but you say you were still surprised when you went on this tour. Why was that? There's a number of things that we know from housing, from the territory. We know the numbers. We know the stats. We know those horrendous things like suicide is nine times the rate. Women in the North experience three, at three times violence than elsewhere, among so many other numbers uh, related to uh, abuse and violence and, quite frankly, uh, ultimately death. When we <clears throat> look at what is happening in the North, what is happening for Indigenous people. What we're looking at is a lack of basic human rights, a lack of availability for safe places, for clean drinking water, and for affordable food or affordable living. Ultimately, when I look at all my comments, messages, emails, phone calls, meetings, interviews, a lot of it ties right back to housing. And when we look at an individual's quality of life, when we are looking at the right to self-determination, being able to fulfill opportunity, ultimately we need to make sure that people have a safe place to go to at the end of the day, a, a place where they can rest, a place where they can eat, and a place where they can be with uh, themselves and their family, and a place where that they can ultimately be safe. Um, so we know all the numbers, we know all the stats. What we don't necessarily hear is how that impacts and how that trickles down from the federal government severely underfunding housing in the north and what that means for individuals on a community level. So I was really focused on being able to talk to individuals and grab firsthand experiences to have a really holistic idea of how this really impacts the territory. It seems the most widespread problem or one of the most widespread problems from reading the draft report is mold. In fact, a family felt they had to put a chronically sick child into foster care because of it. So how do you fix this problem quickly? I think ultimately the excuses that we have heard time and time again is time. And ultimately though, what it is, it's money. If the federal government was really invested in the lives of Northerners and the lives of Inuit, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We wouldn't be talking about what are the immediate solutions. The immediate solutions are providing safe places, making sure that people have adequate housing and that communities have the infrastructures to support those needs. What we have seen over the last 50, 60, 70 years in the North is that lack of respect for adequate basic needs. What we continue to see is excuse over and over again. What we do need to see is the federal government actually put their money where their mouth is. Invest. Sharing the wealth is sharing the health. And we've seen that during this pandemic, that those that are wealthy, those that are at the top and rich aren't worried about their day-to-day, -day, aren't worried about their month-to-month, check-to-check. Meanwhile, these very, very glaring issues in the North are being presented even farther because of the pandemic. 
uh, in the immediate, we need to see the federal government provide real uh, funding for real adequate safe places and real infrastructure in northern communities. Now, it's pretty well known that, uh, that uh, your tour and what you witnessed contributed to your leave of absence as an MP. So was there any one thing or was it just a combination of everything that uh, really stressed you out? I think <clears throat> there were a number of things. I had worked in suicide prevention with the government of Nunavut before, worked in a number of other jobs related to uh, Inuit employment, uh, recruit retaining and uh, retiring Inuit employees. So understanding how different things really impact individuals and having a really holistic view of what is happening in the territory uh, was something that I had, uh, but seeing it firsthand and walking into repeatedly for three weeks, moldy home after moldy home, hearing story after story of, you know, you had mentioned uh, there were, I had met parents who had lost their children to the foster care system. Ultimately though, what I saw was the result of such severe uh, neglect, such severe neglect from the federal institution that people were now taking their own lives, that people were now in situations where they were maybe stuck in years of abuse, in years of trauma, and that these cycles were were in full force and still being carried out due to the federal government not fulfilling their obligations for for decades and now all we see is excuse after excuse which quite frankly you know and going there seeing this knowing that the federal government has stood there and say that they know they know they they have said this they know that housing conditions are horrific they know there's more work that needs to be done but to actually see it and understand full force holistically how this really impacts individuals in a home how this ripples out into community the fuel of frustration and stress that is put into it that the federal government doesn't have to interact with but is the purpose of was a very very frustrating and overwhelming feeling to deal with to come back and say i'm now faced with an institution that says they know this is happening but i just saw all this really heartbreaking stuff and it took a while for me to really wrap my head around it uh, near the end of the report so you write that you're just getting started and that there is much more to be done a very tall order so how concerned are you, or what are you doing so that you don't suffer this burnout again? I've, there has been a lot of learning, that's for sure. And uh, a lot of learning in the last year and a half since being elected and a lot more learning in myself over the last six or so months. I've had a lot of support from my party and from my colleagues, <clears throat> excuse me. I was uh, pretty, pretty nutty in the first nine, uh, 10, 11 months. I worked a lot, uh, often days anywhere between 12 and 16 hours. I didn't take two consecutive days off until July of 2020. And uh, so since campaign to be working like that uh, is a lot for anyone. I've really found that balance in taking time away from work and finding personal things that I enjoy doing. I've been doing a lot of beading, a lot of sewing. I couldn't find a rug I like so I'm making a rug and just doing things like that that really allow me to separate myself from work and do things that I enjoy. I've also been able to access uh, trauma-informed counseling through work which has been a tremendous help as well and uh, with the support of, of my party that was able to happen. So there's a number of things that have been going on. I've also got a new dog who's my who will be my emotional animal support. So there's a number of things that I've been working really hard on for myself. And over the last uh, few months since coming back around Christmas has been just a world of difference. And it's really, really important to take care of yourself. Self-care is so important. If you're going to be there for others, you need to make sure that you're you're good and you're okay yourself. So there's a number of things that I've been doing and planning on continuing to do. 
Well, that's good to hear. Also, I want to talk about this report we've both been mentioning. It's a draft report, but it's coming out officially next week at around the same time on Nunavut Housing Forum, which is scheduled for next Friday. What are you hoping this event does to get movement on the housing crisis in your territory? I hope it can bring that full scope view of what it means when there is such a severe amount of underfunding. What unfortunately we don't see throughout the territory and a lot throughout Canada, quite frankly, is the good initiatives that are happening and the amount of hard, incredible work that people are putting into with what they have. We and, and, and that's what I saw during community visits when I was traveling was frustration, arguments, was tension, was uh, almost community feuds happening over things that were a result of severe underfunding of the federal government. So I really want this report to give the holistic view of what it means for an individual to community, uh, for to have a lack of safe spaces and adequate housing in the territory, but also what is being done and what has been done with that amount of funding that the federal government has provided and what more can be can be done because ultimately I know people are very frustrated, people are very upset and rightfully so, very rightfully so. But let's direct our anger at, in the right direction, which is the federal institution who is the institution that has been severely underfunding the territory for decades. So I really wanna paint that picture and make sure that we are putting our support in the right direction and we are making sure that we are getting the, the clear picture of what it means uh, to have a lack of safe spaces in the territory. Well, Ms. Cockcock, I want to thank you for taking some time to speak to me about this issue. Thank you so much for having me, Todd. I appreciate it. Matna. We'll have more after a short break. Welcome back. Just before the break, we heard from Nunavut MP Mumilak Cockcock on the continuing housing crisis in the ter her territory. But of course, housing continues to be a problem on many First Nations across the country. And no one knows that more than our next guest. Kevin Hart is the Manitoba Regional Chief for the Assembly of First Nations. He also holds the AFN portfolio for housing, infrastructure, and emergency services. Welcome to Nation to Nation, Regional Chief Hart. Good morning. Uh, how would you describe the current state of housing in First Nation communities across the country? Well, in the last year, during this pandemic, it's been apparent that historical uh, failures by successive governments has resulted in a humanitarian crisis on our First Nations in terms of the needs for housing, in, uh, in terms of the need for adequate infrastructure, in terms of needs for uh, adequate medical facilities in First Nations, for example. Uh, we know right now that uh, our northern and our remote communities have been drastically affected during this pandemic uh, of COVID-19, impacting some of the uh, worst regions in the country. Manitoba is one of them. We can talk about other regions respectfully. You know, you see the high numbers that are occurring in Alberta, as well as Saskatchewan, as well as the alarming rates uh, that are occurring elsewhere in the country. Now, you characterized it as a humanitarian crisis. What do you mean when you say that? What we've seen on the ground, for example, when you've seen high rates of infections happening in northern remote communities uh, here in Manitoba, uh, you see where overcrowding has resulted from a, a lack of housing, where you have 15, 20 people living in a three bedroom home. Now you have somebody that has a, an infection of COVID-19 in that home. Well, you're guaranteed that almost 75% uh, of those people are going to get sick. And then you think of uh, the underlying health conditions that are prevalent in First Nations on top of 
this uh, humanitarian crisis that we talk about in housing, you know, it's just, it just shows um, all the social conditions and such that attribute to this impact that's occurred and it has been uh, especially uh, shown to us in, in studies and data that it, it's affecting First Nations on the ground each and every day at a dramatic rate. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, I talked to NDP MP Mumilak Kakak before the break, and she talked about so the federal government knows this is a crisis but is doing nothing. Is that how you would characterize it as well? Well, it's indeed been a, a struggle. You know, we have seen investments in First Nations compared to the previous government from uh, the current Liberal government. How, however, it, it's like a uh, dropping a dime in the bucket, so to speak. Uh, for example, right now, uh, us as uh, the Assembly of First Nations, we do a pre-budget submission to the federal government. And right now, we're currently asking for $4 billion to address the, the chronic housing needs of uh, uh, housing infrastructure in First Nations across the country. Do you need a promise from the federal government like they did to fix the water crisis, uh, which was supposed to be fixed by now, but isn't? Uh, do you need something along those level and then the money, the funding to follow it? I think that we need right now from the prime ministers to see the third world conditions of uh, a G7 country and, you know, how it portrays itself out there as a, a humanitarian champion. I think it's time that they need to fix what's occurring in their own backyard with their treaty partners and to ensure that this humanitarian crisis that I've stated time and time again needs to be addressed by this government in the upcoming budget. You've seen the billions of dollars that have been given out to Canadians in, in terms of stimulus uh, during this pandemic, in, including infrastructure money that was announced by uh, Minister McKenna and other various ministers in various other uh, ministries and sectors, including you look at natural resources, you look at uh, CMHC and such, you see uh, some of the recent uh, announcement in terms of rapid housing by the federal government. And, you know, we asked for direct uh, uh, set aside for First Nations to be part of that to address this uh, housing crisis, especially right now. Um, you look at uh, Cross Lake, for example, and what's occurring right there with COVID-19 and the impact of the lack of housing in, in a large uh, northern community. You can look at uh, Matthias Colomb, who currently has an outbreak of COVID-19 and due to uh, historical uh, underfunding from governments, as I stated again, that's resulted in uh, you know third world conditions that uh, we have high numbers of COVID-19 just simply because of that. Now, of course, uh, we've been talking about, I know I've been hearing about the housing crisis as long as I've been at APTN, which is over 20 years. Uh, is it just the price tag is just too much? Why won't the federal government step in and finally tackle this? Well, I don't see why the federal government doesn't see it as a uh, win-win for not only First Nations, but for Canadians as a whole. Now, do you think the Prime Minister or Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller fully appreciate the scale of the situation? I think that uh, Minister Miller knows it. I told him this message time and time again. Um, the Prime Minister knows it as well. But I think the reality that needs to be done is that uh, I need leaders, you know, I need you as brothers and sisters out there. Uh, we need, I need your help. You know, uh, I live in a First Nation that has a home with, you know, all the problems just like everyone else out there. And, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, uh, old housing, uh, 
mold in, in housing and such, you know, I, I live that reality as, as one of your leaders that lives in the First Nation. And, you know, I want to tell you all that uh, I want you to take photographs and videotape your home and, you know, let's show the Prime Minister in Canada and the world, you know, this is the reality of First Nations in 2021. Because, you know, Tanam, uh, I'm ready to do that with you, my friend, too. If you ever want to bring a, uh, a camera crew here, I can show you the, the realities that us as First Nations live each every day. Well, Regional Chief Hart, that's per certainly something uh, we may take you up on. Uh, uh, I know that we've, APTN News and Current Affairs has done many stories over the years on, on the housing conditions. And, uh, you know, it's usually mold, it's, it's things that are run, you know, repairs that need to be done. Are these the kinds of things that the people, uh, the grassroots people from First Nations call you up and tell you about? Well, the, for, for the ones that uh, know us, that, you know, that we live together as family and, and, and neighbors in the community here, uh, our circles here, that they know the realities that I live in as a member here in the First Nation, that, uh, as a guest. And that, uh, you know, this is my wife's community that uh, I married into. But, you know, they're beautiful people. You know, we're humble people. And that's something that uh, I was taught by the people here in, uh, in ceremony. And, uh, you know, it's something that I, I hold uh, near and dear to my heart. And, you know, it's, it's with that humbleness that I advocate for our First Nation people out there each and every day. Because uh, I've lived those struggles. Well, Regional Chief Hart, uh, I'm sorry to hear that you lived those struggles and uh, who knows how much longer this crisis is going to go on. But uh, thank you for speaking to me today. For sure. And then, you know, one thing, Todd, uh, before you go, I just want to say that on top of the housing crisis, you know, it's ever evident with the, uh, with the how, uh, homelessness situation that you see, not only in our urban centers, but in First Nations right now. And that uh, this pandemic has shown um, even more homelessness. That's for sure. Uh, again, uh, Regional Chief Hart, thank you for speaking to me. All right, you take care, Todd. I'll be back in just a few minutes to say goodbye. Welcome back. With two great guests on the show today, we're all out of time. But if you missed any part of it or a past episode, please subscribe to the Nation to Nation podcast on your device. Or go to aptnnews.ca slash podcast as they've archived our past shows for the past few years. I'm Todd Lamaran, and I hope you're staying healthy and keeping safe and getting vaccinated. Thanks for watching.